Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Wow, so many people here that have nothing better to do on an Atlantic crossing than coming and listening to me. Well, I'm really happy that you're all here, and I look forward to uh, talk a little bit about what we did when we built this uh, magnificent ship. Because she's magnificent, isn't she? We had a couple of um, videos uh, through the uh, through the uh, presentation here, and uh, then uh, when we're done, I'll. Uh, open up for some questions uh, at the end and uh, maybe some of the questions that you uh, that you start to think about in the beginning they, they may get an answer throughout the presentation here but if you have something at the end then absolutely we'll, we'll have some time to uh, to go through it so uh, the first show is a little bit of a video here and we took out the ship out on the dock so when we when we took out the, the, the harmony, which was in May uh, earlier this year, uh, we were 2,400 crew members roughly, and uh, it was uh, a lot of a lot of things that came together. And uh, my presentation here is a little bit about what we what we did in order to achieve that, because it goes quite quite far back uh, with uh, what we have done and what the Royal Caribbean has been uh, doing with. Uh, STX France, as it's called now, before it was called Chantiers de Atlantique. And uh, I always thought that that was a beautiful name. It sounds like a poem or something, Chantiers de Atlantique. So it's the shipyard of the Atlantic. And the first uh, purpose-built cruise ship that we built was called Sovereign of the Seas. And she was delivered in 1988. And um, she is one of the reasons why I am working at sea, and one of the reasons why I'm working for Royal Caribbean International. When I was 16, or maybe 15 or so, 15, 16 years old, uh, there was an article in the Swedish Shipping Gazette about the building of the Sovereign of the Seas. And uh, that's when I really thought, wow, that would be great to, uh, to go to sea and uh, give up my uh, non-existing uh, a career in becoming a professional hockey player <laughs> and uh, of course a lot of development has uh, gone into uh, to changing all the different classes of ships but at the at the delivery of the sovereign of the sea she was the biggest cruise ship in the world and here is a comparison to the uh, this is the oasis so pretty much the same size as what we have and one of the sovereign classes yeah, I cannot say whether it's uh, Sovereign, Majesty, or Monarch. But this picture is from NASA as they're coming in. And there you see a little bit of about the perspective from the biggest cruise ship in 1988 to the biggest cruise ship in 2009. We were built in Saint-Nazaire uh, on the uh, west coast of France. And uh, we had... Uh, our two sister ships before us was the Oasis and the Allure that came out in 2009 and uh, 2010. Uh, when we started to build the uh, Harmony in, uh, in St. Nazaire, the yard was pretty much a cold yard. They had nothing really that was going on. The previous cruise ship delivery they had was delivered in 2010. So it was a start-up of a lot of things. So for all purposes, the Harmony of the Seas is the first in class, although she has two sister ships that are very similar in all the designs. Of course, in the uh, few years that has uh, passed since Oasis and the Allure came out, a lot of technology has changed, and uh, we have basically new equipment everywhere around in the ship. You can just imagine what has happened with your car in the last 10 years, or, or even your cell phone. Uh, the, arguably the most popular cell phone in the world today uh, didn't exist 10 years ago. 
It came out in 2007, and uh, now most of us are carrying one of these around, and we are getting number seven uh, out now. So 10 years ago, the iPhone did not exist. You can imagine how much technology has increased and improved and become available. That in combination that we built the previous two ships in Finland made it that basically everything that we did here is in a new ship. And of course, we, in the meantime, we had the delivery of the Quantum class, where I had the privilege of being the support starter captain for both Quantum and Anthem, with all the technology that we were using there. So we kind of merged everything in together into a Harmony class. And of course, we have some other ships that are coming out that are going to be similar to this. And uh, the next one is coming out in 2018. And her name is Harmony 2. <laughs> uh, the first building of, uh, of the ship uh, started in uh, 2013, in September, with the uh, steel cutting ceremony. And it's a big thing when you start building a ship. There might be two years, three years of design work that goes in before you actually start to cut the steel. And it's a big ceremony, and I have, this is mine, the uh, little shape here of the ship, of the Harmony. At that stage it was only called Oasis 3. And uh, this is now mine that I'm showing you. It's a little bit difficult for you to see, but this is part of the, of the uh, traditional things that we do when we when we build the ships and uh, the next uh, big uh, step that we that we do with the ship is when we have the uh, um, key laying which i'm going to talk about a little bit uh, on the next slide here but basically what we do when we cut the steel is we we cut the steel we put them together into big blocks pretty much like lego blocks and then we are putting them down we weld them together, and uh, we uh, have now, this is one of the grand blocks here from the key ceremony. And uh, at that stage, she was referred to by the yard as A34. The next one is called B34, and if there is a 30 class, as we have, then it's going to be C34. Uh, the French uh, yard has a opposite logic there when it comes to the uh, classes. So this is the 34th class of ships, or series maybe we would call it, because not all classes are from A to Z. So there are a lot of ships that has been built. Uh, it's not only 34, but it's 34 times 20 something. So they have a long history of building ships in, in St. Nazaire. And of course we have then the lucky coin ceremony and the key lady. And the man on the picture here is uh, Mr. Harry Kulavara, that is the genius and the mastermind behind all our ships. And he's been working with our company for a couple of three decades and uh, he comes up with a lot of great ideas. I'm sure that some of them have been scrapped, but a lot of them have actually been realized uh, on the fantastic ships that we have. He started with the Royal Promenade concept back in 1980s uh, on uh, a ferry company that went between Sweden and Finland. And he told me earlier this year that he already at that stage had the idea about a split superstructure, as what we have here, a Royal Promenade and a Central Park and a Boardwalk concept. But at that stage, the technology was not there. The uh, Ships were not big enough to uh, handle it, and the cruise industry was not there yet. But in 2009, that's when the Oasis came out, and obviously she revolutionized the uh, cruise industry. The lucky coin ceremony uh, is to. I should go back one on that. The lucky coin ceremony is uh, something where we, we, we as sailors, were very superstitious. And uh, who's driving it? Fully <laughs> um, we're very superstitious, and we uh, want to ask for blessings, and we want like to be lucky. 
So that's where the lucky coin comes in. So we put coins underneath the keel when we have the keel laying ceremony, and then when we take the ship away from the dock, and uh, then we pump out the water in the, in, the, in the dock again, we go down and we collect the lucky coins. So these are my lucky coins for Oasis 3, because by the time that they took it out, she was still not named the Harmony. So there is a euro and a quarter, a dollar. Uh, so one from the US, which our company supplied with, and the euro that STX supplied with. So that is emerged into this block uh, for uh, good luck and for, for blessings, pretty much. Then, as I said, we, we have like Lego blocks that are putting in, and it, it takes a big crane here. This uh, crane, the Gantu train, is carrying 600 tons, and we're lifting up the different blocks to put them together like Lego, pretty much. And there are just under 90 blocks on this, uh, on this ship that we put together. And uh, as you can see here, or maybe you cannot see, but now I'm telling you, that this is space here is where we are right now. This is the cut for the Royal Theater. And as we are adding up the, uh, the blocks, you see up here is the bridge. And here is then the, the bow that is being put on. And the next one is about, the next video here is about five minutes long. So uh, take your time and look at it. There are a lot of different things uh, that, that is coming into the, uh, to the video here. And a lot, of, it's a little bit of a time lapse of things that we are, have done.
see when they were putting on the different blocks and stuff like that it's sometimes or quite often easier for you to see in a video than for me to explain it the uh, of course we have a lot of a lot of uh, technology up and around but what really is making the ship move of course is our propulsion system and we have uh, acid pots on this ship and uh, it's basically we have three electrical motors that are pushed down through the uh, hull and that we can turn 360 degrees. Each of them have the power of 20 megawatts. So there's a lot of power. And uh, here you see it underneath and then you see from the top here. So the blue, whatever here, uh, beneath here is the water line basically, or the draft line. And above is obviously above, and so you can see everything that is underneath on this on this slide here. And uh, that's a little bit of a comparison to what you have in the size. So that 20 feet, about uh, six meters uh, or so in uh, diameter, six seven meters in diameter, and uh, they are huge. For those of uh, you that have had the opportunity to be underneath any any ship or boat of any significant size, you can imagine how big it is in order to be 20 megawatts on the, on the propulsion. And here we also get a little bit of a perspective of how big the engines are. We have six engines, we have two that are uh, just uh, under 19 megawatts, we call them 18 and a half, and then we have four that are 14 megawatts. And you can see the man here in the corner, let's say that he is uh, six feet, then you can see, and he's even closer to the camera, so that's the perspective that you see here. So they're quite, quite high, massive. Uh, this ship is uh, under something called the safe return to port concept. So we need to have a redundancy in everything that we, that we have. Uh, any technology that we have need to have a redundancy. And therefore, one of the reasons we have two totally separate compartments for the engine rooms. And uh, if something would happen in one engine room, we have another, we have different switchboards that we can run totally independent of everything. All in all, we have 128,000 horsepower generated by these generators that we have. And here you can see the uh, bow thrusters. We have four of them, and uh, we have 7,500 horsepower on each of them, just about 5.5 megawatts each. And of course we can spin the ship around them on our own axis. So our turning diameter is 316.2.12 meters long. If I'm doing my job right. And we spin on our own axis like that. And some of you uh, saw when we uh, swung around, both in, uh, in uh, Barcelona when we left, as well uh, as yesterday when we left Malaga. We had a pretty quick turn right then we were spinning spinning the ship around and it's not a really good way of seeing the the size here but when I was underneath here I just barely could not walk straight under so there you get the size as well 
of how big they are. This is what we call a sea chest. We take in the cooling water into the ship, so that is, that is not a small uh, thruster. We have the big ones that are there. The grids are so we avoid getting uh, debris into the, uh, into the uh, thrusters, as well as making her more sleek and slim. And uh, you can see here on this one that we have a different Dolbus bow here. The, the French Yard are famous for making fast ships. And this is a fast ship. We are about one and a half not faster than what the Allure is. And that is a huge improvement. That's part of the 20% more energy efficient that we are on the Harmony compared to our uh, sister ships. And uh, we have better light, uh, less energy um, in the uh, galley equipment, in the HVAC. Uh, on the other ship, the, the captain has a Harley, here he has an electrical scooter. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of things that we are doing here to, uh, to improve on the energy uh, efficiency. And of course the hull shape is, uh, is one of the biggest contributors to that. Of course, we also have two stabilizers, one on each side, that are sticking out about uh, 20 feet on each side when we're using them. And they basically work as an air wi airplane wing. So when we are rolling, they are minimizing it by being active. So they are compensating for the roll. So we lift on one side and we force the other side to go down. Most cruise ships uh, today uh, has uh, something like it. Uh, like step, like step. Here comes another video about uh, how the outfitting went. <coughs> We are down to the wire here at STX. We have outfitting happening in almost every area on the ship. It is a frenzy, but a good frenzy. We have entered the end game, the ninth inning, so to speak. That's where it all happens. Uh, the ship is pretty much finished from the steel structure, but the interior outfitting, the ship becomes the ship now. It gets its looks, and that's all happening within the last three months. When you walk on board Harmony of the Seas, you will see tilers who are tiling away. You'll see the painters painting the, the bulkheads. You'll see people cleaning because there are plenty of spaces that are very close to completion. And now we've started the inspection process where we will attempt to take over the spaces little by little until delivered. This is actually a very gratifying moment in the process of building a new cruise ship because this is the time when you start seeing the ship really come to life. We're also starting to see a tremendous change from day to day or week to week. You go through the different areas, you see the changes. When it comes to the staterooms, when it comes to the uh, royal promenade, walls are coming up, hiding the steel bulkheads, and even putting in carpets in quite a few areas. We have carpets already. We're getting close now, we're getting close. All of my theatrical spaces are coming together, and now is the time to make sure that they're exactly as designed, because we're putting in a lot of very precise lighting, sound systems, flying equipment. If things are out by a millimeter, it won't work as designed, so we're here making sure that everything's perfect. Nothing in the industry comes even close to what the harmony of the seas is. To build something like the harmony of the seas, you know, it may be the third in class, but don't forget, this is the first time STX France is building a Oasis class ship. I can't wait until delivery day when we can see all of these venues in their final stages ready for the guests to come on board, and it's just going to be amazing. So the outfitting is really when we put all the things into the different areas. And the, uh, the carpets, etc., is uh, tiles and, and interior bulkheads and ceilings are examples of, of how we do it. And there's a little bit of, of uh, statistics here with a bit of numbers. So I'm going to leave it there. But just think about the enormity here of having over 44,000 square meters of public spaces that we need to put in. 2,747 guest staterooms that needs to be equipped. And uh, of course there are some areas that are more important to other uh, or 
more important to some people and other areas are more important to others. So it, we need to get together, we need to have a combined focus of the priority order and what do we need to have fixed first before we we uh, put in, for example here, we need to have the carpets in there before we put in the chairs. And that is just a very simple example of how we need to line up the different uh, part of the outfitting. 7,000 odd pieces, 4,000 kilometers of cables. So for those of you that are working in, in uh, miles, that's like 3,000 something. 3,000 miles of cables that we're gonna that we have put in 100,000 lights. So there are a lot of things here, and this is from this area again here. And the uh, production manager that is backstage here now, John Shaw, he was the uh, in charge of all the entertainment areas here, and I think that he did a fantastic job of of making sure that the Royal Theatre as well as the Echo Theatre and Studio B uh, are in such a good shape that they are, and they can provide you with this fantastic entertainment. So you think he did a good job? Yeah. Okay, yeah, he says he will pay me later. <laughs> uh, of course, we also had the, uh, the uh, abyss, the slide here. So we wanted to put in one so we could try it out and uh, see is this really going to work the way that some other guys had come up with the plans. And it turned out to be quite successful um, test. So we said, okay, let's go on the other one as well. So we completed. Uh, both of them in time for the delivery. We have a lot of tests uh, that are going on and the most exciting is the sea trial where we really put the ship through the worst we can possibly happen. And that's the only time in the ship's life that I would like to have bad weather. The worse the better because we really need to test and to see what the ship is capable of, of doing and how we're going to respond to the different things. One of the things that we are testing is the rolling, okay? So we want to see that the stabilizers are working the best that we can. So we managed to get 3.7 degree list on one side and 3.3 list, 3.3 degree list on the other side. So just about seven and a half degree amplitude when we force the ship to roll. That's how stable she is. Of course, we put a lot of things, not a lot, but a few things in after we did those tests, but still it's an indication of how stable she is. For those of you who are into uh, uh, stability on ships, she has uh, five and a half meter GM. Uh, so that tells maybe nobody here anything, but anyway, that's what she's stable. <laughs> and we're also doing a lot of different tests. Um, I think that we said on the previous slide is some of the what we're doing. We're doing stopping distance. She stops in five ships length from full speed. 18, 1800 meters, so just over an American mile that she stops when we do full stop. We try not to never do it again, avoid those situations, but if we know uh, that we have to do something, we alter course before that happens. But uh, if nothing else happens, we know that we can stop in five ships length. And there's not a car in the world that can do that. So she stops very fast. And she's also fast going forward, as I said earlier. 25.1 knots was our highest speed during the sea trial. <laughs> We're also testing all the safety equipment. Here on, the, on this slide, you see one of the high font, which is uh, basically fine mist that are being pushed out. And most of the ship is covered by uh, high fog. And it's a very, very, very good fire suppression system that is cooling down and binding up all the heat and also of course taking out the fire. So if we would have a fire in the stateroom, it's very seldom that that would be spread due to the fact that the high fog would open up and that we would be able to contain anything in, in one stateroom. We're also testing uh, lifeboats, the uh, smoke extraction. Many of you have uh, maybe not even noticed, but there is a little tower in the, uh, in the um, um, Central Park, and there's basically funnels. If we need to take any smoke out of out of the uh, Royal Promenade, they is being sucked up and blown out into 
central fault. <coughs> Just a couple of comparisons here. Uh, we're higher than the, or well, we're taller, longer than what the Eiffel Tower is. We are uh, 362 meters and 12 centimeters. So a lot of people are asking what's the difference between us and the allure, and it's really 30 centimeters. And many of you have been on the Oasis and the allure, and the difference there were, was 50 millimeters, so two inches. And the two captains there during the show up, Captain Bill Wright on the Oasis and Captain Sini on the uh, allure, they were bantering between each other who has the biggest cruise ship, but it's not even a discussion here, so I'm not even gonna mention it. <laughs> And of course we are uh, uh, 67 meters wide, or just under 67, 72 meters high with the funnels up, we can retract them, and then we go down to 65 meters roughly on the height. And draft just over 9 meters. And that is it from me for this one. But before we go into the questions, I just would like to say, that this is not a one-man show. It may be so here today, but this is for 2,200 crew members that are making this possible and to giving you the vacation that you have here. And each and every one of us are just equally important because whether you see the crew member or not, they are in the support team for each and every one of us that may be out on stage or in the front. So there's a big group here behind uh, the stage here now, just so you could see this one. And I would like to point out our first officer, uh, Stefan here, that has put this program together here. So he is the real hero, although I am the voice right now. So. <laughs> so Stefan has been with me uh, uh, for a couple of ships, and he was part of the Oasis startup, as well as on the Anthem uh, when I was there, and now he's been with us since the startup in the yard. A lot of the crew members that you see here now, have been in the yard during the startup. Some of us have gone and come back, but uh, we still maintain the continuity of the delivery service that we that we built up already in uh, in France and to set up the teams. So it's really the whole the whole crew that is building the harmony of the seas because the ship is just as great as its software equals the crew, regardless of how how beautiful all the things are around us here. All right, so we have, we should have a couple of uh, crew staff members here, we have over here. And uh, if you have any questions for me, please uh, raise your hand, say where you're from, and uh, then you can ask uh, the questions into the microphone, so one at a time. <coughs> Two questions. Number one, I've noticed that the exhaust is quite yellow. Why is it yellow? And the second question is about the birds that we've seen on board the ship. Are they going to get off or are they going to die? Well, uh, let's start with the, with, with the birds. Well, the cool stowaways. <laughs> so they, uh, they are hitching a ride over the Atlantic. Uh, whether we're going to get rid of them or not, I don't think so. Uh, we can't really uh, do anything with them. Uh, we have enough. But maybe I should move up here so don't get the feedback. Um, we have enough food in the freezer so we don't need to harvest them. <laughs> um, so uh, I like them. I think it's great that they are here. Maybe we'll get a nest up in the Central Park somewhere where uh, we can have a colony of birds. Uh, when it comes to the smoke, yes, thank you very much. Uh, that's, a, that's a good observation. Um, a few years back up in Northern Europe, we started um, a decree, I would probably would be the, the English word for it, that we should reduce the sulfur in our uh, fuel oils. So I was working on tankers and we were bringing low sulfur fuel from Sweden to England and down to Western Europe. Sorry, high, high because we were in Northern Europe we had different rules. So we were bringing high sulfur fuel to the British Islands and the, the Netherlands, etc. And they were burning that up. And then it went with the westerly winds and they dropped it over Norway and Sweden. While we in Sweden were burning low sulfur fuels and it went up with the chimneys, went with the westerly winds and were dropped in the Baltic states. 
So that was maybe 30 years ago that that was implemented. Now the rest of the world is kind of catching up. I think in 2020, it's supposed to be a worldwide uh, decree that we should not use more than 0.1% uh, sulfur in our emissions that are coming up. So we have what we call a scrubber. It's an advanced emission program. And uh, we basically wash the emissions. And what you see is coming up, as you say, as a yellow smoke. It's a little tinted um, steam, really, that is coming up. So if you compare us, it looks like it's thick, but it's steam. Because, of course, when, when we are uh, washing the, uh, the emissions, then that creates steam. And therefore, that is what comes up. So if you compare us to some of the other, where you see black smoke coming out, uh, actually ours is much better than the black smoke that is coming out, even though it looks thicker. Captain, will nuclear uh, power ever become a reality on cruise ships? Uh, you should never say never to anything, really. Um, I doubt that it will be anytime soon. Um, we are looking into other uh, fuel like the LNG and even fuel cells. A couple of weeks back, Royal Caribbean announced that we are signing up for a new class of ships called the Icon class that will be powered by LNG and fuel cells. Um, LNG power has been around for a while. Fuel cells really hasn't been a while, uh, available for a long time. Nuclear power also has the political sensitiveness. Uh, in addition to that, you need to really, really highly educated in order to handle it. Uh, so I doubt that it will be in any time soon. My name is Van Sesslin from Vancouver, Canada. Uh, what is the cost of the construction of the vessel? And how many man hours do you use to build a boat? Well, first of all, sir, This ain't no boat. <laughs> Do you know what the difference is between a boat and a ship? Number one, the spelling. <laughs> Number two is that a ship has a captain and a boat has a frustrated husband. <laughs> I cannot confirm nor deny, but if you Google it, it probably says 1.5 billion. And of course, you should always believe everything you read on the internet, right? <laughs> so uh, that's uh, that's where we are, pretty much. Man hours, I don't have that number, but it's a lot. Uh, we were, as I said, about two and a half thousand crew members that were working uh, for for a while. Uh, we had about at that stage about 4,000. Uh, yard workers that were on board and of course for the last four or five years we have had hundreds and hundreds maybe even thousands of designers that have worked on different areas and you know you have people working all over the world to provide the components to the different things so I don't have a number but there are millions 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 of, of hours that have been put in probably millions of millions of days uh, that have been put in work days for mandates, all right? So, we had that a uh, few time ago, a boat, a lifeboat, uh, with a lifeboat in Marseille. Is it true? Uh, you have to talk into the, the microphone so I can hear the question again. <laughs> a couple of time ago, in the port of Marseille, a, li a lifeboat Something happened to them. Can you tell us what was there? Um, I can tell you. <coughs> it's classified. It uh, was in the papers. Yes. Uh, the media. Yes. We did have an unfortunate accident uh, on one of the lifeboats in Marseille a few weeks back. That's correct. And uh, unfortunately, one of our crew members passed away. We had uh, four other crew members that were injured. Two of them uh, came back uh, within 24 hours back to the ship. So they were with us when we left. And uh, the other two have been uh, repatriated home 
and one is still in a hospital in a recovery unit uh, and or not recovery re rehabilitation unit and the one has been released from the hospital and I hope that all of them will come back and work with us here on the uh, on the harmony It looks like you have 18 lifeboats. Uh, will all the passengers and crew fit in the lifeboats? <laughs> and if not, who gets first choice? <laughs> Which net are you on, sir? <laughs> uh, no, you're, you're good with the calculations. Um, we have the three th uh, 370 people in each lifeboat. And you times that with 18, you're not going to get to 8,880 people, which is the max capacity that we have here. But we also have something called the MES, which is the uh, marine evacuation system. That is basically uh, life rafts that are being deployed, and then you go down the chute. Uh, similar, but not exactly like the Abyss, because it's a soft, soft shell. That was not meant as a joke. <laughs> uh, then you go down into that, and then you go down into the uh, life rafts, and then you get uh, deployed that way. So we do have space for uh, uh, all the people on board, plus 25%. Each ship, anywhere in the world, has to have the extra 25%. Thank you. Good evening. I have a very simple elementary question. I am intrigued by the little bar in the bathroom that you press and the tremendous amount of power that comes through it. And I would like to know where is all this power coming from and where does it go? <laughs> yeah. I can't really say that that is very much to do with the construction of the harmony, and I will give you a couple of reasons. Number one, number two. <laughs> um, well, it obviously is a vacuum system that we're using, and that is in order to minimize the use of water. If you flush something back home, you use the water to flush things. Here we use uh, a little bit of water, but also a vacuum system, a suction program. And wherever it goes at the end, it goes down to the tank. Don't want me to be much more graphic than that, do I? <laughs> no. All right. But it is collected, and it's not pumped overboard without being treated. Hi, Captain. My name is Joe. And um, my question is about, um, on the Allure and the Oasis, the crown and anchor on the back above the um, um, diving show came from retired ships or sold ships. What is the story on the crown and anchor on this ship? Where did you hear that? <laughs> from a prior captain. From, yes, you should never believe a captain that has a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> but you should also never let truth interfere with a good story. <laughs> did you... Uh, uh, that's not true by the way. But if you would like to, I can say that it's from Nordic Prince. <laughs> we looked into it uh, on a couple of different ships in the past, and the, 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 uh, the Oasis and the Allure were, were two of them, but uh, the, the shape uh, the shape was great, but the shape of them was not great. So I hang something up there that was not in a good enough condition, just doesn't make sense. We would rather have um, do something that is Looks the same, but it's but it's a new. But it's an old design. It's a design from an old crown and anchor. We can say it that way. Yeah. Hi. My name is John. I'm from Davie, Florida. And I remember reading uh, some time ago, a couple years ago, that some municipalities were requiring would require cruise ships to use onshore power while in port. As you know, in port Everglades, there can be as many as eight to ten ships. Uh, uh, on a Saturday or a, a Sunday. Um, curious, as, is um, how many equipped to take on onshore power? 
<laughs> is home really equipped to take on onshore power? I would say yes and no. Um, a lot of the time that we spend uh, alongside in, uh, in, uh, in the yard, uh, we, we're using shore power, as most ships are when they are being built. Uh, then, depending a little bit on what kind of different connections you have, and what kind of different frequency you have on the, uh, on the electrical power grid that you're using. And also, uh, in a lot of the places in the world, the electricity that you get out is not as clean as ours, as I explained to you here earlier. So, um, at this stage, there is not a decree anywhere that you have to have it uh, in the area where the ship is planning to sail. And I don't think Flora is going to go that way because their power sources is not very clean in comparison to ours. And neither is California's, by the way, that has that decree. Hi, Captain. I assume that it's a landing pad on the ship. And if it is, what is the maximum distance that it from shore that it can be utilized and under what circumstances other than medical emergency that it might be utilized? Uh, I like to read the New York Times, so it comes in every morning. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the helicopter pad here behind me, I'll use this one here. The helicopter pad here is uh, carrying up to 10 tons of a, of a helicopter and the helicopter pad on any ship is not there to take anything away from the ship. It's actually there to be used in an emergency. We have a lot of food here, we have a lot of blankets, we have a lot of beds, we have a lot of capabilities, we have three doctors, five nurses. So if there is an emergency on another ship, there could be a helicopter that will pick up uh, somebody that is in uh, distress and then they drop it off here without having to go to land. And the distance where it can be used is up to the helicopter. I'm not a helicopter pilot nor an expert, but a couple of hundred miles away from shore we usually be able to, uh, to get a helicopter if we need to. Captain, does my question is very simple. Can we have some of these facts on paper like they have on the other ships? <laughs> On the, the facts on the ship? On the harmony. Yes, yeah. we do have something called a fun facts, and I might be wrong, but we usually have them at the guest services desk. Yeah. Yes, ma'am, we do. Uh, because we hand them out on every captain's corner, and we will have a captain's corner later on in the, uh, in the cruise, so we do have them. If you hang around uh, after, I'll get your statement number, and I have one sent to you. Up here. <laughs> Captain on a center mast. What is that Star Wars device on the starboard side? <laughs> okay, stand up so I see you. <laughs> Balcony, oh, up there. Okay, up there. that's not center mass for me. Center mass there for me, yes. I'm talking to center mass across the ship. There's a, like a Star Wars device, I believe on the, yes. That one? Yes. Uh, yes. That one there? Yeah, that's it a looks like a ray gun. Yes, it's a spoiler. In order to uh, avoid or to minimize the airflow that is going into the uh, into the central park, because we have the wind coming over the uh, solarium roofs on top of the superstructure here, passing, and then we want it to go up over there, and that is also the reason why we put in a, put in a, um, a, a glass roof underneath the uh, the uh, Viking crown area here which the other two ships don't have. So that is to minimize the airflow going into. So for those of you that are, it's really hard to compare two ships because you say, oh, there was a window here, was a window there. Uh, unless you have exactly the same place at the same time, uh, it's, you cannot really compare it. But we have less draft in the central park than what you have on the Oasis and the other. On top of that spoiler on the starboard side is a Star Wars-like device. It looks like a ray gun. What is that sitting on top of the spoiler? Yes, it's a crane. When we take things out of the uh, out of the uh, uh, central park, for example, we need to reach in there. We use it. Okay, so two questions: the fresh water we drink, I assume, is desalinated water from the seas. How much 
in terms of gallons do you desalinate a day? And secondly, how do you keep the center of gravity below the water line with such a massive structure above the water? What weight do you keep below the water line? Uh, well, uh, we have a couple of uh, evaporators where we are boiling basically water. And then we also have the reverse osmosis uh, uh, system on board. So we take about 1,500 tons of uh, fresh water that we produce every day. So that's the capacity. So we are self-sufficient. As long as we're driving around, we are self-sufficient on, on producing our own water. Um, and in the bottom of the ship, we have thick steel, 36 millimeter steel, and we have the engines. We have much heavier things down in the bottom. Up here, it's, it's very roomy. It's not very heavy. It's not very dense here, so it doesn't carry a lot of weight. So therefore, it turns out to be like a, like a, um, the bottom uh, that you put on top of the water, it's going to fall down. But if you pour in a little bit of water, it's going to sink down a little bit, it's going to fall over. If you put on a little bit more water into it, it's going to sink down a little bit, and then it's going to stand there and bobbing. And if you, of course, if you pour more water into it, it's going to capsize and, and, and sink. But So that's where it is. You cannot put in too much water too high up to fill up, but you need to have a bit of water or weight in the bottom so that it will stand up. Very simple. You can buy it at home. <laughs> Try this at home. <laughs> yes, Anthony again. Yes, uh, I'm Richard Fritz, from Alexandria, Virginia. Um, the uh, navigator and freedom class ships have a solarium pool, which is easily accessible to the uh, disabled because it has flights of steps down into the water. But I've been unable to locate any equivalent facility on the Oasis class. Uh, why was that discontinued? Uh, I cannot say why we took away the pool in the uh, solarium on this ship. We have a pool in the Oasis and the other. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, what kind of uh, accessibility it is uh, into that. Uh, but one of the suggestions that we have here from this is basically coming from you guys that you want to have a solarium pool. So that has been brought forward uh, that we should have that. I cannot promise that it's going to be, but at least it's been brought up that is one of the needs or one of the things that we would like to have. So we, we made one of the outer pools an adult pool only in order to cover the adult pool part, but of course it's still out in the open, so it's not covered. It's a very valid point, and uh, point taken. That's, I, I can't say why it disappeared, but I know it did. And you're not the first one that's telling me. Probably won't be the last either. Hello, Captain. I'm Linda from Belgium. Uh, we wonder what size will the ships be in 2040? Will they get bigger, 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 bigger? In 2040? Yes. In 24 years from now? Uh, who cares? I'm going to be retired. <laughs> Well, I'll go on a cruise. <laughs> uh, I have no idea, but I'm sure there will be something amazing. Uh, in the next five years, I think that you will see ships uh, develop in a very different uh, way. Uh, all kinds of different uh, technology, as we talked about earlier. And uh, you know, the sky's the limit, really, uh, what it comes to. I hope that uh, in the next 20 years, we don't have ships without captains. <laughs> Because who would then be here making jokes with you guys? <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you, Captain, for uh, giving up your time for all these questions. Now, I have two questions. And the first one is, what was the minimum, or what was the tolerance for the 90-some blocks to assemble the ship? Measurement tolerance, you know, millimeters or what? Yes, definitely millimeters. Uh, between the blocks, uh, it's not so bad, but it's more of all the connections that you need to cut in and you need to make your roll from pipes to, to cables that we need to pull. But many of the, of, the, um, of the pipes were, you know, sort of given a leeway. So they, if the edge is there, the pipe stop there, so you need to put in a, a, a joint so that you will see how long the joints need to be after the blocks are put together. But, uh, you know, a few millimeters, 
not more than that because then you wouldn't be able to weld it together. And we're all the uh, we're all the mechanicals inside the blocks as they assemble the blocks. No, just, not all of the mechanicals. No, some of them. Some of them. And then the, the second question was. Why did Royal Caribbean go to SDX and not have it built in Finland? Was it because of the uh, height of the store bridge? Uh, no, uh, at this stage I'm not sure exactly why it happened, uh, but we are building ships, a lot of ships in Finland. Uh, we're building ships in all the, the three major um, yards that we've been using in the past, uh, which is SDX in, in Turku, uh, Meijerwerft, and uh, now Chantiers the Atlantic. Um, Meyerwerf has now bought STX in Finland, so now it's now Meyer Turku. And uh, STX France is maybe being bought up, at least it's for safe, at least some part of it. Uh, so if you have a thick wallet, you can buy it, or if not, go down to the casino. <laughs> 1.5 billion, right? Uh, so, uh, I don't know exactly why, but it might have been with the order books where we could get the ship to be delivered. Because obviously we're not the only player in the market of building cruise ships. We haven't built any ships, as far as I know, in, uh, in Italy, that some of our competitors do. Uh, we have been building on the north and west coast of Europe rather than in the map. Thank you. And right now we have orders uh, in all three yards that we continue building, either for Royal Caribbean. Uh, actually, we have in all three yards, we have orders uh, for Royal Caribbean International. And of course, we have our sister uh, brand, the Celebrity, that are building in, in France. And uh, we have uh, Mindshift, that is also being built in, uh, in uh, Turku. So we are using, using all of it. Hello, Captain, I'm Don from Fort Lauderdale. Um, there's some story among the passengers about a, a big meeting next Friday of the Three Sisters. Can you uh, tell a little more about that or is it still kind of a secret? Uh, I can tell you everything that I know. Uh, there's no problem with that. Um, I might not know everything, but we are going to meet the other two uh, Oasis classes, the Oasis and the Allure, in the afternoon on the 4th of uh, November. And uh, we will line up, many of you have seen the picture of the Oasis and the Allure, where we were together and we took pictures and uh, kind of used that as advertising. And I presume that that's the plan to use the pictures that we're going to have there as well. So we're going to line up all three sisters in a row and then taking pictures and uh, there are going to be some fireboats spraying uh, fires, uh, or oh, not spraying fires, <laughs> spraying waters. So uh, we're going to be a couple of cables away from each other and uh, hopefully the sun will be shining so it will be a good uh, good dusk shot of the three sisters. 50% bigger than last time. You want a drink? Yeah, can we get, somebody can get water to you? Yeah, yeah, no? Uh, how many years does Royal Caribbean project it will take to recover the cost of building the ship? Well, that's uh, part of those things that is uh, within the corporate uh, uh, secrets. Uh, if you are interested in economies, Google it and see what would be a typical return of investment. And then you can read at the bottom of our balance sheets, which is uh, public. Uh, but in a specific ship, you probably need to be in the upper, upper uh, hierarchy of Royal Caribbean to, to get that information. Okay, can you tell us, um, do, do we release the waste and the trash and the excess food into the ocean? Yes, and again, the building of the Harmony uh, was built on uh, the regulations that we are not doing that. Uh, you've been cruising with us before? Yes, you heard about save the waste? Yes, yes. So then we, we have the, uh, the program that's called Save the Waste, that we don't throw anything overboard, uh, which includes then the waste and uh, the trash, as you mentioned. And uh, we have uh, systems that we take everything, including the famous vacuum, 
<laughs> and we take that out into tanks, and we are treating them with uh, with uh, in a, in a bio reactor. And to uh, this is going to get really gross now, but since you're asking, so we we uh, we uh, differentiate between the liquids and the solids, and then the uh, liquid is as clean as we can drink it. Uh, we don't. We bottle it and we sell it to Carnival. <laughs> That, that would be the biggest laugh of <laughs> And then the solids, we are either burning or we can land it. On this ship, we burn it. Yes. And the uh, the water, the liquids that we do compound, we do that after 12 nautical miles uh, away from uh, any land. The international rules is four nautical miles, but we are above and beyond in that as well as in many other things that we are using. And do you keep any fuel for helicopters when they come in an emergency? No. <laughs> they need to carry their own uh, uh, half gas. We don't have that. They're so specific, different engines that are using different fuel. It would be possible for us to uh, have anything like that. And of course, also, it's highly flammable, and, and we don't want to keep that around. Uh, Captain, having had the privilege of traveling both on Oasis, Allure, and now Harmony, uh, I have been extremely impressed, as I'm sure we all are, with the fact that all three ships were virtually filled of, with people. My question is, um, are you able to fill all of the ships in Royal Caribbean uh, to the max, as it were? And are there ships that have been built that have been either sold or sent out to pasture with, if you will, at, 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 with Royal Caribbean? Uh, yes, we are. We are still filled. Uh, all the uh, we're still filling all the ships. Uh, we have had a fantastic European season where we've been filled to the brim. Uh, most of the cruises and uh, the booking look fantastic for this ship going forward. It's a question of demand and supply, and somebody that's much more clever than I am, uh, well, now they left here, but maybe going into the economies uh, here, that you know what, what the price for the cruise is going to be and things like that. Uh, so we're trying, obviously, we, we're a public uh, company and we, and we work for our our shareholders to do the best out of it. So yes, we're, we, an empty ship is not good business, let's put it that way. And some of the older ships though that we have are not, we cannot provide the, the features and the amenities and the entertainment that we would like to give all of you guys when you are on board our ships. Uh, so therefore we are, uh, we have sold a few and we have also started uh, to move our ships within the mother uh, company. Uh, to Pullman Tours taking over a couple of them, we started up a joint venture over in China where one of the celebrity ships went and became the golden era for Sky Seas. Uh, so there are a little bit, but we, um, Splendor of the Seas, we, we had that one let go uh, earlier this year and Legend's gonna go next, next year to one of our, I wouldn't call them competitors, we probably wouldn't sell it to com competitors, but they're working in a different segment than what we are doing, and therefore we can give it to them if we can <coughs> encourage people to come on a cruise, and maybe that would be the way in for them to come and cruise with Royal. And it's not a goal in itself for us to have the biggest ship. The goal for us is to give you the maximum entertainment, food, luxury that we can within the reef. So sometimes people say to me or they ask me, so don't you think that the ship is too big? And I go, okay, what would you like us to take away? So we take away the theater, we want to take away the one of the dining rooms, what you don't know, because this is what we would like to provide you guys with and therefore we need to have the real estate to be able to do it. So that this one is 30 centimeters longer than Allure is not a goal in itself. It just happened. Hey there, Captain. Uh, Captain, due to the influx 
and all the uh, violence in the world today, uh, how safe should we feel aboard this ship now? <laughs> really? That's the best you can come up with on, about the building of the harmony. Okay. Um, we have a, a few different other subjects that I'm going to bring up here throughout the cruise here, and also we have something called the Captain's Corner. So I will answer you, but going forward then for the next questions, can we try to concentrate on the building of the harmony and what we have here, please? Uh, absolutely 100% safe. You can feel 100% safe here. I wouldn't be here if I wouldn't feel safe. No job is worth my, my health or, or the health of the family or, or my friends and that we have here, including you. All right, next one. Captain, one other. Uh, why wasn't the uh, solarium fully enclosed? Uh, Sometimes it's hard for me to answer why not something happened. Uh, usually easier for me to answer why things happen. Um, it is a development. I don't know if we're going to close on the next one. We haven't uh, we haven't made that decision yet. Uh, it is much more closed than the Oasis and the Allure. It's much bigger. Um, so who knows? I also asked the question to myself: Why don't we close it in? A couple of different reasons. Uh, we would have to have air condition running through. Uh, we would also then not be able to have the fresh air uh, if we would be able to, uh, if we would have it enclosed. So there are a couple of different uh, reasons, I think. Uh, but that's my personal. I haven't discussed it with, uh, with, uh, with the powers uh, upstairs. The only reason I mention is that there are uh, days like today, and these days it's pretty cool in there. It's, it's not comfortable to sit out there when it gets this cool. That's why I was wondering why it uh, doesn't have that out. A lot of the other ships do have uh, have enclosed ones. Yes. Okay. Thank you. For but, for as I said, it's uh, this ship is also built for good weather. It's not built for bad weather. It's one of the reasons why we're going fast south, so we can get a little bit uh, warmer and less wind. Uh, we're about 20, 21 knots at this stage. Required speed is 19. So I'm trying to get a little bit further south to avoid a little bit of bad weather that is up north. And we're not heading, heading straight. We're taking a little bit of a detour to get to warmer weather faster. Uh, before we reach Florida, you probably have had enough hot weather though, I would think, up there. And then you want to go in and have a little air conditioned area with a jacuzzi. Hi, uh, I have a question and an observation. So the question is, well, first of all, the observation is that the roll buoyancy, I was very glad to see it was much better than the Vasa. And, uh, but the, the question is, the length of the ship, does it, how much does it change with the sea temperature? Can you, do you know how much the expansion of the ship is from one part of the ocean to another? Uh, no, I don't, but it, it does differ, obviously, when it gets hotter, yes. the steel expands, so, but I don't, I don't have a number. So do the, the Oasis and the Allure, they don't try to find the hot seas to prepare them? Or? <laughs> no, all of them are rectified to a specific uh, temperature, which I believe, don't quote me on it, let's switch off all the cameras, I'm just kidding. Yeah. I think it is 20 centigrades uh, that everything is being, uh, and the uh, elasticity coefficient for, for steel can vary a little bit, but it's, it's a relatively simple formula to, uh, to, uh, to calculate it. Okay. Yes, Captain, over here. Can you tell us anything uh, about the decision to use external stabilization versus internal gyroscopic? Uh, probably cost efficiency uh, because if you would have to stabilize everything that is inside, in order to have, you would probably have to have an outside shell that is moving and then having an inside uh, room that would be stable. Uh, now you have a stabilizer that is not eliminating the, the rolling, but it's minimizing it. It would be Maybe difficult, because I'm thinking now how the gyro is hanging. It would probably be pretty difficult to build a ship like that. 
you know much more about this than what I do. <laughs> well, let's have a couple of more questions here. It seems like afternoon is leaving here, so I'm either boring or have other better things to do. Uh, hi, Kevin. Um, thank you very much for your time. Uh, the question I have is, uh, the, this class of ship is defined as 120,000 ton, but the steel you use is quite a bit less. What's the difference? What it makes up the difference about the the weight versus the steel used? Uh, well, um, the gross tonnage is a volume measurement. Uh, so we are two hundred twenty-seven thousand gross ton, which is the volume of. Uh, there are some things that are not included, but basically the whole volume of the ship. Uh, the ton name ton comes from the French word of barrel, which is a ton, a barrel of of something, and uh, I guess that they wanted to calculate how many barrels of red wine they could transport in a ship, <laughs> uh, and therefore it became a ton. And uh, one ton is uh, 2.83 cubic meters, or 100 cubic feet. Uh, and the weight of the ship, the displacement that we have now is about 106,000. The light weight of the ship is 83,000. So if you just take the ship and put it on scale like this, it's 83,000 metric ton. So that's, that's the difference. So Captain, um, I've only ever been on small ships doing around the world. I'm just wondering with the wonderful size of this ship, the length of it and the width, are there any places that you'd like to take this but you couldn't take this ship? Are you oh. Panama Canal? Or, um... I'd like to take it home. <laughs> Uh, but no, but yes, of course there are some restrictions on the on the on the ports. Europe is tight. All the ports that we have been to in Europe have been have been tight. Some of them have expanded the ports to be more accommodating for us, like for example Marseille. And in a few days I will talk about the ports in one of the sessions uh, here that we have been to. Uh, so yeah, there are many places that we cannot go to, but also there's a lot of places that would like us to go to their port because having the influx of six and a half thousand uh, guests that comes ashore and hopefully uh, at least being tempted to spend some money towards the local uh, economy is, is very beneficial. Um, there are some cities in the world that doesn't really care about that, they don't want to spend the money in order to get a terminal for us, but tourist areas typically would like us to come because we, we're good business. Thank you. A place that we're like to go, where I couldn't go, uh, Port Elizabeth in South Africa. Yeah. That's my closest port where I live. Uh, I'd like to know how deep the pool is than the uh, aqua show. The aqua show pool, okay. I, it's deep enough for the guy that dives from 17 meters. <laughs> uh, I think it's about four meters deep. So that would be... 13, 14 feet maybe, something like that. Captain, from Colorado, I have a question. I commend you on this outstanding effort you have put into entertainment, electronics, audio, visual, but I have a question. Is there ever going to be anything other than CNN for the news? <laughs> I 
Thank you for your fantastic comments, sir. <laughs> uh, I don't have a really good answer on that question. Uh, we've been uh, we've been looking into different uh, news outlets uh, for some time, and uh, we had uh, the other um, outlet for a while, and then that was cut. Um, it probably goes down to what we can uh, what we can put in. We, I get the question quite often: uh, Why only CNN? And uh, when we were only running Fox, we got why are we only running Fox? Um, we know why we don't get ABC, of course, obviously. Uh, so uh, I cannot say why we don't have Fox anymore. I suppose it would be would be for the cost. Yeah, ABC is Disney, you know that, right? So yeah, they have a cruise line on their own. So that's all I can say, sir. Stream it. Get on the boom, and you can have it. Any, any outlet you like. But uh, I wish I, we would have a couple of more as well. And a couple of sports channels. Captain Friday. Stickers. Good afternoon. My name is Nyla from Hesperia, California. I have a question about quantum. We could only go out of um, New Jersey because the port was on. That was the biggest port to carry it. Now that this is being the biggest ship and we're going into Florida, did they increase um, Florida's port or is it something different about this ship than the quantum that allows it to go in? Uh, quantum is a quantum class uh, ship. That's the quantum, the anthem, and the ovation. And this is a different class of ship, uh, oasis. And, and uh, quantum class will definitely be able to go to Fort Lauderdale. Uh, so I don't know, maybe if I didn't ask you a question ish statement there. So, I guess when I. No, not really. When I actually took quantum, they said that my the Fort Lauderdale port would not um, could not house it. That's why they had to have it sailed out of New Jersey. Uh, well, that is probably nothing to do with the size of the ship. Maybe more the scheduling of ships that were there that they didn't have any terminal that was available for them because uh, quantum is about 40 meters shorter and about 40 meters more narrow. So there's no restrictions in the port as such to take a quantum class ship to Fort Lauderdale. Okay, thank you. Welcome. All right, two more questions. Or no, maybe no, maybe no questions. But there's one down here as well. Quick, quick question for you, Captain. Were you? and selected to Captain the Harmony, or was it an interview process among the other captains? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, the only one that was dumb enough to say yes. <laughs> and I don't know exactly how it happened to be me. I've been part of the new building uh, uh, program for quite a while. I was a startup staff captain on the other of the season when we took her out, and I was the support captain, as I mentioned earlier, for the two uh, quantum and anthem, and then about two years ago, they asked me if I wanted to be startup uh, captain for this one. And of course, it's a big, it's a big thing to be to be startup captain for for anything really. And of course, being in on the harmony. So yeah, I said yes. Spoke to my wife about it because of course it's a big commitment and spent a lot of time away from home in the last couple of years. Uh, and uh, then uh, said yes. And uh, how many other captains that have been asked before me? I don't know. Uh, if it was any, uh, but they they asked me, and uh, here I am. A kind of technical question: What's done, or how did they design the ship to reduce uh, drag, to increase efficiency? Uh, well, the. Uh, the hull shape is much more sleek, and as I mentioned earlier, the bulbous bow uh, is different to reduce the uh, the uh, interaction with the water. 
Uh, we have the ALS, which is an uh, air lubrication system that is pushing out bubbles underneath the, the flat bottom of the hull to reduce the friction between the hull and the water to make us roll. Um, and the famous spoiler up there is reducing drag a little bit in the way that we designed the, uh, the, uh, the half ceiling or half roof of the, uh, of the uh, solarium is also one part that, uh, that reduced the drag to it. So there are a lot of things. The, the duct in the stern was to release the water so it doesn't keep dragging it with us. The, the shape of the pot, the, um, the, the underwater part of the, before the propeller, the shape of that is also important in the, in the drag. So there are a lot of things that goes into it. And they, the, the French guys are really good at it. We've got to give it to them. Very well, very well made. Oh. How many hundreds of people, thousands, Thousands of people that were involved, maybe tens of thousands of people are designing all different types of things from the chairs to the speakers to the underwater hull to the engines to that's thousands of people. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming here today. And uh, thank you for taking so much interest in it. Have a good afternoon. See you around the ship. And for now, bye bye.